what you're here for. Today's program here in the Hall of Philosophy is to begin our amazing week focused on the theme of reclaiming the Bible in a non-religious world. This week's distinguished lecturer is the Right Reverend John Shelby Spong, the retired Episcopal Bishop of Newark, prolific author, and an in-demand lecturer. John Spong is the author of more than 20 books that have sold over a million copies. He was an Episcopal Bishop for more than 24 years, and during his career, he has lectured at more than 400 colleges and universities around the world. In 2010, his portrait was commissioned to hang in the Hall of Honor at the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel at Morehouse College in Atlanta. All the Atlantans that are here are permitted to clap. This is great. I knew there would be a few. Today, he will address the question, the Judeo-Christian faith story, how much is history? After his lecture today at 4 o'clock, right here in the Hall of Philosophy, Bishop Spong will engage in a conversation with Roger Rosenblatt with a focus on Roger's new book, Kayak Morning, and all are welcome. We are truly grateful for Bishop Spong's presence with us and for his wife, Christine, who is sitting in the front row. Christine, we're so happy to have you here with us and for the wisdom and insights, Bishop Spong, that you will bring to us this week. You will be pleased to know that he will do a book signing on Wednesday on the porch of the Hall of Missions immediately following his lecture. And in case you want to know a little bit more after you leave here, you can sign up for Bishop Spong's weekly email letter in front of the Hall of Missions right out there. Let me now say, and I want to say this with the way in which I truly feel it, we are grateful beyond words to the Eileen and Warren Martin Lectureship for Emerging Studies in Bible and Theology for the support, the support of this week's lecture. Warren Martin came to me at one point and wanted very much to be sure that Chautauqua always was looking at cutting edge theology. And so he made a marvelous gift to Chautauqua that makes this possible. Warren is seated among us. Thank you, thank you very much for your generosity. So now please join me in welcoming to our podium Bishop John Shelby Spall. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Christine and I are so pleased to be back once more at Chautauqua. I think this is the sixth season that I have filled this two o'clock slot in the program at the Hall of the Philosophers which means I've been here under the leadership of people like Ralph Lowe and Ross McKenzie, and now, of course, Joan. What really tremendous people all three of them were, are. <laughs> you all know that Chautauqua is a rather unique community. From my perspective, this is one place where religious ideas can be discussed without awakening the Inquisition. And without having someone say, you cannot step outside the traditional religious box. I have loved my times here. Some of the richest and most stretching moments of my life have occurred on this campus. I remember particularly an occasion, perhaps 25 years ago, when I was the afternoon lecturer and Buckminster Fuller was the morning lecturer all five mornings of that week. And because neither of us was traveling at that time with our wives, Bucky and I ate dinner every night together in a corner table in the Athenaeum. By the end of the week, Buckminster Fuller had translated the Lord's Prayer into scientific categories 
that satisfied his particularly inquisitive mind. The only trouble is that every day during that week, the Lord's Prayer got longer. <laughs> and by the time he finished, it was a four-page prayer covering with every loophole cut out to suit, to suit his possibilities. I recall another week when I was here with Rabbi Jack Daniel Spiro. I remember telling him anybody named Jack Daniel couldn't be all bad. <laughs> he and I did something in this hour called a search for Jewish Christian understanding. And it was that week that brought me immediately and deeply into the friendship of the Chautauqua Jewish community, which I have relished. I do hope that this week we can do something equally bold, equally informative, and equally remembered. And I hope you're going to enjoy it so much that you're going to break all attendance records. <laughs> Let me sketch out just a little bit of history about how I came to prepare this class in this particular way. About 10 years ago, I was invited to be the summer lecturer at a resort community in the mountains of North Carolina, about an hour south of Asheville, south and west. In that, that community planned a summer lecture series and a musical concert series, staffed mostly by members of the Atlanta Symphony, who vacationed in that area of North Carolina, as the two planned activities that they would entice and entertain the summer visitors, the summer guests, as well as those homeowners in that area. It was a very southern audience, right from the heart of the Bible Belt. The people came from Florida and from Georgia and from Alabama and South Carolina, North Carolina and Mississippi. And most of them were highly educated. Most of them were quite successful people. They had to be because that resort community was a very expensive and exclusive kind of community. So they were doctors and dentists and lawyers and business leaders and university professors. And I started that summer and continued for the next eight years to do a series on the Bible for intelligent people. Things like how the Bible came into being. I was amazed at how many educated people in that part of the world actually thought that the Bible dropped from heaven, fully written, divided into chapters and verses, and in the King James Version. <laughs> if the King James Version was good enough for Jesus, it should have been good enough for everybody else. I also went in that series into the meaning of the prophets, and I was amazed at how many educated people actually thought that these great Jewish thinkers were some kind of ecclesiastical Walter Winchells, that's for those of you who are over 50, <laughs> or Jane Dixon for perhaps those of you who are a little younger. They thought that prophets predicted future events. I also went into how the Gospels came to be formed and why they could not have been written by eyewitnesses. I remember being on a television program some years ago that came out of Burbank, California. And the host, who was a sort of, uh, how shall we call it, he was a disillusioned Roman Catholic. And as I talked about when the various books of the Bible were written, he turned to me and he said, now wait a minute, Bishop, I just got out my short pencil. And I tried to figure, if, they, if the Gospels are written as late as you say they are written, they could not have been written by eyewitnesses. And I said, that's right, Tom, they weren't written by eyewitnesses. And he said, that's not what the nuns taught me. <laughs> this was Tom Snyder, and I said, what did the nuns teach you, Tom? And he said, they taught me that the disciples followed Jesus around and wrote down everything he said, and that's where the Gospels came from. I said, Tom, did they tell you they use ballpoint pens and spiral notebooks? <laughs> I think all audio, this audio equipment is demon-possessed, and this one falls off regularly. 
I also went into the epistles in that class, the epistles attributed to Paul, and I marveled at the fact that no one in that group seemed to be aware of the current scholarly consensus that Paul only wrote seven of the epistles that are attributed to him. He did not write 2 Thessalonians. He did not write Colossians or Ephesians or 1 and 2 Timothy or Titus. And I'll leave it to you for a few minutes anyway to figure out what that leaves. Those that he perhaps did write, the authentic Pauline epistles. I became aware in that context of the enormous gap that exists between academic centers of biblical scholarship and the knowledge that the people who occupy the pews on the Sabbath or on the Sunday services of worship actually seem to be in touch with. So I decided that there was a mission for me. I would teach this class in these mountains in the same way that the Bible would be taught in a class at the Harvard Divinity School or at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City, which are, I believe, the two top centers of religious scholarship in the United States. So into that summer class, I examined all of the biblical contradictions that I could discover. I looked at the Bible's terrible text that I would later call the sins of Scripture, texts that are used to abuse and hurt other people. And my utter amazement with this class was that it became wildly popular. This is the Bible Belt of the South. We even had to move the venue to a larger space to accommodate the overflow audience. What fascinated me even more was that these very bright and well-educated people in almost every area of their life actually reflected a knowledge of the Bible that would at most be fourth grade Sunday school thinking. I wondered why we had allowed this to develop. These people took to this class as people might take to water in the desert. And one person said to me, you know, I never believed a lot of that biblical stuff anyway, but I thought I had to. And so I just kept quiet, the silent majority. Indeed, the response was so enthusiastic that I decided to try to reach an even larger audience through a weekly column that I've written for the last 10 years. And that column took off like it had never taken off before. It now reaches into every continent of the world. It is open some weeks by as many as 100,000 people. And in that column, I went into every book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And despite Alan Jones' open invitation this morning, I will leave the book of Revelation to those strange people who like to predict the end of the world. I went into the background, I went into the historical context in which each of these books was written. I went into their primary passage or message. I located in these books the familiar passages that people use today in their common language without ever realizing that they're quoting the Bible. I wanted them to see what the Bible really said. And then, and this was probably the most popular of all, I went into those weird things that you can find in the biblical story. One of the things I had great fun with was compiling a list of all of the human misbehaviors for which the Bible recommends the death penalty. Folks, if we took those passages literally, there would not be any of us here still alive. If we took them literally, the death chambers of American prisons would be working 24-7 each year. Do you know that in the book of Deuteronomy, we are told that if a child is willfully disobedient and talks back to his or her parents, 
That child is to be taken to the elders of the city and stoned until dead at the gates of the city. Now raise your hands. How many of you would still be alive? <laughs> and we call that the word of God. It also says in the Bible that if you commit adultery, you and your partner are to be put to death. And I shall not ask how many of you would still be alive. <laughs> the Bible says that if you worship a false god, you shall be put to death. Well, who is going to define the true God? Is it going to be Benedict XVI or Pat Robertson or the Ayatollah Khomeini or Adolf Hitler? You see, whoever does the defining puts everybody else at risk. The book of Leviticus says that all homosexual people should be put to death. In the African country of Uganda this past year, inspired by American fundamentalists, tried to make being a homosexual person a capital crime in Uganda. And they were stopped by the rather forceful intervention of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. My favorite behavior in this list of capital offenses came when I discovered in the 20th chapter of Leviticus that if you have sex with your mother-in-law, you are to be put to death. <laughs> now, how many of you knew that was in the Bible? How many of you have ever heard that text preached on? How many of you have ever imagined it? And the fact that you laugh means you just imagined it. <laughs> Laughter is a very revealing emotion. These columns that I wrote on the Bible, which covered three or four years of the eight or ten years of that column's life, then became such a success that my publisher, Harper Collins, asked me if I would turn these columns into a book, which I did. And it came out in November of this past year, 2011, under the title, Reclaiming the Bible for a Non-Religious World. And then we had to argue about the cover. Publishers are not always the brightest lights in the room. They wanted to fill this cover with pictures of great religious art taken from the museums in Florence and Rome and London. And I wanted to depict this, the Bible engaged in real life. And so we compromised, and they got three classical religious portraits and I got three contemporary controversial scenes. My three scenes were a portrait of the suffragette movement in the 19 teens, where women were marching for the right to vote before the Constitutional Amendment of 1920 gave them that right. And they were vehemently opposed by the major voices of the Christian church who quoted the Bible. The second of my controversial scenes was the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. marching on Montgomery in quest for civil rights for black Americans and doing it as a religious imperative. And my third picture showed two men's hands clasped together with wedding bands on the proper finger, symbolizing the struggle for gay and lesbian people for equality in marriage in this country. The Bible is a book that has engaged the prejudices of our society. It's a book that has been quoted to justify the prejudices of our society. I would like to reclaim the Bible for its primary function. I wonder how many of you have ever stopped to reflect on the fact that every time the Bible is quoted in the public arena, in a public or political dispute, the Bible is on the wrong side. And that goes back a very long time. We've been quoting the Bible to justify anti-Semitism through the centuries. 
from the early church fathers, and I regret that there were no mothers, to Martin Luther during the Reformation who wanted to burn synagogues, to the horrors of the Holocaust that occurred in a developed Western ostensibly Christian nation, while religious leaders looked on with benign neglect. But the Bible was quoted as long ago as 1215 to oppose the Magna Carta and to support the divine right of kings. The Bible lost. The Bible has been quoted throughout history to justify slavery, to justify segregation. Remember, it was the Bible belt of the South that institutionalized slavery and that fought with its mighty power to stop desegregation. The Bible was also quoted to keep women in second-class positions. It was quoted to oppress homosexual people. It was quoted to justify the persecution of other religious groups. And sometimes even to justify hatred between competing groups in the same religion. Have you not noticed that the battle between Catholics and Protestants in Ireland is not much different in its cruelty from the battle between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq? When even the most devout people hear this record of history, and began to realize that the Bible has not been a universal blessing. Then a sense of despair and wonder sets in. But for me, there's an even deeper and more powerful insight. And a word of judgment that comes out of this analysis. And that is, for some reason, the leadership of the Christian church has historically been reticent to share Christian scholarship with the average person who sits in the pew on Sunday morning. We have had contemporary critical biblical scholarship abroad for at least 200 years that when you mention some of these things in an average congregation, you find that they are almost scandalized. 200 years, and it hadn't yet reached the pew. Someone said that the church likes to treat lay people like mushrooms. You keep them in the dark and you cover them over with, shall we say, manure. <laughs> manure. <laughs> in my columns in this new book, and I hope in this class this week, I will have an opportunity to change that attitude to invite people into the things that are commonplace in the academies, in the world of biblical scholarship. Now let me add a personal word so that there will be mo no misunderstanding. I happen to love the Bible. I study that book every day of my life. I've read that book from cover to cover more than 25 times. Some parts of it many more times than that. But I am one priest and bishop in the church who is no longer willing to read that book through stained glass lenses. This week, what you will hear will be words that remind me of a song I used to sing in the South at, when I went to church camp. It was a little bit denigrating about Southern Baptists, but we didn't mean any harm. They were just outnumbered only by the sparrows. And so we always defined ourselves against them. That song said, young folks, old folks, everybody come, join the Baptist Sunday school and you'll have a lot of fun. Please check your chewing gum and raise us at the door and you'll hear some Bible stories like you've never heard before. And then the verses went on with those stories. I'll only mention one. Pharaoh had a daughter. She had a winsome smile. She found the baby Moses afloating in the Nile. She took him home to Papa with that same old tale. 
which is just about as probable as Jonah and the whale. <laughs> or some of you who might have seen the recent revival of George and Ira Gershwin's American classic, Porgy and Best, that's just come back in a rather magnificent presentation in New York. When one of the characters named Sportin' Life sings about the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. We will look at that. Now let me set the stage for the rest of the week by concluding this first presentation with what I would call bullet points. Statements about the Bible that I believe are absolutely established in the world of biblical scholarship, but we still disturb some people when they hear them for the first time. I'll do little more than file them by title. Now I'll do, just to prove I'm not superstitious, 13 bullet points. One, the Bible is a relatively recent book. It's not an ancient book. Put it into context of history. Our universe is between 13.7 and 13.8 billion years old. The planet Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Life began on this planet about 3.8 billion years ago. Human-like creatures emerged out of the primate family perhaps as long ago as 4 million years. Spoken language is probably no more than 100,000 years old. Written language, somewhat more than 15,000 years old. Civilization began in the Nile River Valley and in the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates, somewhere between 10 and 12,000 years ago. But the Bible, it's only 3,000 years old. It's a relatively recent book. Number two, Moses did not write the Torah. Moses had been dead for 250 years before the first word of the Torah appeared. And if you read the Torah, you will know that in the 34th chapter of Deuteronomy, the last book of the Torah, the story of, death, of Moses' death and burial is told. It's a remarkable author that can write that. <laughs> and if you haven't read that story, you ought to. God and Moses are alone in the valley of, of Moab underneath Mount Nebo. And Moses dies and God buries him. There's nobody else around. And God writes his obituary. And God had a lot of things to choose from because Moses had a rather illustrious career. But what God said about Moses according to Deuteronomy is that Moses was 120 years old when he died, and this is King James English, and I quote, his eyes were not dimmed, and his natural force was not abated. I'll put that into contemporary English. <laughs> Moses, at age 120 when he died, needed neither eyeglasses nor Viagra. That's what that text means. The Torah was actually written over about 500 years by multiple authors. Number three, David did not write the Psalms. Most of the Psalms are written after the exile, somewhere between 500 and 600 years after the death of David. Number four, Solomon did not write the Proverbs or any other part of the wisdom literature. One surely wonders how it came about that a man who had 300 wives and 700 concubines could ever have been thought of as wise. <laughs> Number five, most of the Hebrew prophets were counterculture creatures. They would have had that unwashed bearded look. Not the kind of beard that Alan wears, that's clean and neat. Theirs would have been scraggly. These prophets did not have any idea they were writing sacred scripture. 
That was a decision somebody made about their writings years after their deaths. But they are magnificent creatures who need to be studied. Number six. There are three versions of the Ten Commandments in the Torah. And they do not agree. You cannot really name the Ten Commandments biblically because they don't agree. One's in Exodus 20, one's in Exodus 34, and one's in Deuteronomy 5. And the one in Exodus 34 is probably the least known and the oldest. And the last of the Ten Commandments in that version says, and I quote, Thou shalt not boil a kid in its mother's milk. I am happy to tell you I've never even been tempted to break that commandment. <laughs> Number seven. The first gospel to be written was Mark. And Mark was not written until 40 to 45 years after the crucifixion had passed. 40 to 45 years in that time was two generations. The first gospel was written in Greek. And that was a language that neither Jesus nor any of his disciples spoke, much less wrote. The last gospel to be written is John. And it was not written until 65 to 70 years after the crucifixion. That would be three to three and a half generations after the crucifixion. That's a long time. Everything we have in the New Testament about Jesus floated through some kind of oral transmission for 40 to 70 years before anybody wrote it down. How literal can such a process be? Number eight, Paul did all of his writing between 51 and 64. That's before any gospel was written. Paul died before any gospel was written. Paul didn't know there was such a thing as a gospel. And just so that I can keep you, your attention and you're not still wondering which the authentic epistles of Paul were, I'll now tell you they are 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Romans, Philemon, and Philippians. Number nine. There is no evidence that we can find anywhere that miracles understood as supernatural acts were ever associated with the memory of Jesus of Nazareth before the eighth decade of this common era. Number 10, the story of the virgin birth of Jesus does not enter the Christian tradition until the ninth decade of the Christian era. Number 11, the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven does not enter the Christian tradition until the tenth decade of this common era. Number 12, the followers of Jesus did not separate from the synagogue until 58 years after the crucifixion, which means that when Mark wrote his gospel, he was a member of the synagogue. When Matthew wrote his gospel, he was a member of the synagogue. And there's debate about whether or not Luke was still member of the synagogue. In at least the first two and maybe the first three Gospels, you are reading works of Jewish people who were still worshiping members of the synagogue. The division between Christianity and Judaism is a very late division. And the Christian inability to place its story into a Jewish context is the primary source, I believe, of the way the Christian story has been distorted with literalism. And finally, number 13. Listen carefully. I'm going to go into these later this week. There is no evidence 
that Paul, who recall wrote between 51 and 64, or 21 to 34 years after the crucifixion, there is no evidence that Paul ever heard of the virgin birth. And there is no evidence that Paul ever knew there was a person named Judas Iscariot. Now, folks, there are many more I could have filled this afternoon with statements just like that. But I will stop there for two reasons. One, I would like to have some time left for questions. And secondly, I really want to keep your mind spinning. I want them to be filled with questions so that you can't wait to come back tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Let me say just a word about the question period. Uh, many of you have done this many times before, so forgive me, but for those who haven't, we line up at both microphones. This is a huge crowd, and there, I'm sure a lot of you would like to have questions, so I ask you, perhaps urge you, perhaps beg you, ask a question, not a speech, so that in fairness to others, we can get as many questions as possible, but by about... 10 minutes after three, we will have to conclude the question. So watch your watch. Don't get in line when it's 10 minutes after three. So with that, having said that, let's get the line started. And we go from one side to the other. And I'm not going to be in the middle of it. Uh, I'm sure the good bishop can manage that. Let's begin over here. Well, let me say one word. I have a rule. Every other question has to come from a woman. I don't care what order you're in. And I like to start with a woman if we have a woman at the microphone, and I don't mind waiting patiently until the first woman takes her place. I am tired of listening to male voices only in the life of the church. So, uh, and, and secondly, let me, I see her. She, come forward, and you be first. I would also say that if you would be willing whether you ask questions or not, if you'd write them out and give me your name and your hometown, that's all I need, and give them to me or give them to Joan or give them to my wife, and you can recognize her because she's the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> so just go up to the most beautiful woman in the world and give her a question. And the reason I want them is that I put your questions into my weekly column. I have a Q&A section, and I like to use real questions from real people. And the reason they insist, my publisher insists on your name and hometown is that they want to make sure you're authentic and I didn't sit in my study and dream up what you might have asked if I ever gave you a chance. So if you're willing to do that, I'd be grateful. And if you're interested in the column, there's a place somewhere you can sign up to receive it. With that, I recognize the First Lady. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. With all the discrepancies in the Bible, why should we even pay attention to it? Well, that is a good question. <laughs> but there... We pay attention to the Constitution of the United States that defines black people as three-fifths of a human being. Mm. Some things you have to outlive. You can still treasure the message. And when I pr go into the Bible, when it, and the reason it means so much to me is that I think there are three things in it I don't ever want to lose. And one is that all life is holy. That's to, my, to me the primary gift of the Hebrew Scriptures that God created life, that it's in the divine image, that I have to treat everybody as holy. You cannot enslave or segregate or diminish someone who bears the divine image. And secondly, if I could boil the Jesus story into one sentence, it would be that there's nothing any of us will ever do and nothing of any of us will ever be that will separate us from the love of God. That's what, that, that's what his life is about. And the third thing... And that's what the Gospels give me. And the third thing I would get from the life of the Christian church. And it says that the primary purpose of worship is to enable you to become all that you're capable of being. To me, that's what Holy Spirit is all about. 
That's what Alan is talking about every morning. To quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, to be a Christian is not to be a religious person. It's simply to be a person, a whole person. And I resonate with that sort of definition. And that's the reason that I think the Bible is still worth some time and study. Thank you. Yes, sir. What should be our best response to, uh, in my case, my very conservative literalist uh, Christian friends who are quick to talk about uh, the Quran uh, as, as cited by Islamic fundamentalists in their violence, but they're not willing to look at the violence condoning uh, segments of, uh, of the Bible? I grew up a fundamentalist. My mother died a fundamentalist. What I would recommend that you do is to love them and ignore them. <laughs> uh, I haven't got enough time left in my life to want to debate with somebody who's not informed. And I don't mean to be arrogant about that, but see, I don't debate with people who are members of the Flat Earth Society either. I think there comes a time when you just don't dignify the debate. I feel that same way about the gay issue. Uh, I'm so tired of hearing church people who don't know anything about homosexuality debate the gay issue with biblical quotations. Uh, you know, I don't know of a scientist or a doctor in the world who thinks that people choose their sexual orientation. I didn't choose to be heterosexual. I just woke up when I was 12 or 13 and suddenly girls didn't seem obnoxious to me any longer. <laughs> I certainly didn't make a choice in the matter. And I'm just not willing to, to spend my time debating with people who are uninformed. If you're going to be in the debate, you have some responsibility to be informed. And that goes for Benedict XVI, who says some of the worst things about homosexuals that I've ever heard. And I want to have respect for that office but I'm not going to have respect for that kind of ignorance. But thank you. Yes, I need a lady. What a woman do. <laughs> She's a bishop's niece. My mother and I traveled in Mali with an Old Testament scholar who told us that they are this close to figuring out who put the Bible together. He said that since day one, the books of the Bible have been in the same order, no matter what year you bought it, if you bought it in the year 200 or 1200 or 2000, the books have always been in the same order and that there must have been an editor. <laughs> what do you think of that? Well, the order is certainly not accurate. Uh, one of the things I did in, in this book that I'm working on this week was to, to treat them in order. So I start the New Testament with Paul and Thessalonians and I end it with the Johannine literature. But the order, the order got established in early church disputes. I don't know that anybody actually sat down and said, I'll do this. Uh, they thought that Matthew, and I'm going to talk about Matthew on Wednesday, because it's the most Jewish of the Gospels. They thought it was the transition point, so they put it first. They thought Mark was a Reader's Digest version of Matthew. <laughs> we now know it's the other way around. Matthew copies about 90% of Mark into his Gospel, and Luke copies about 50% of Mark. And the Jesus story was so important that they put the Jesus story first and then Paul after. There's still a lot of people that think Jesus started this movement and Paul came along and corrupted it because the Bible is written that way. Uh, with all due respect to David Brown, who wrote the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> the, the books of the Bible, at least the books of the New Testament, were pretty well established they weren't mandated, but they were pretty well established by 140. Now, they did some tweaking at the Council of Nicaea. I must say, I never got asked questions about the Council of Nicaea until Dan Brown's book came out. Uh, 
But, and, and, and there were political battles going on. There still were as late as Luther. Luther wanted to get the book of James out of the Bible. He wanted to get the book of Revelation out of the Bible. I'm sorry he didn't win that one. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think there was ever a single person who edited. It was a political process of debate, and the Bible was quoted as authority to, uh, to justify one point of view or another. Thank you. Give Jerry my regards. Yes. Um, understanding your desire not to argue with, as you put it, the flat earthers, how do you, and presumably you do want to convince people of the correctness of your argument, how do you convey to those who believe that the truth of the Bible is a matter of faith? How do you convince them of your perspective? Well, I don't try. Uh, what I try to do is to simply analyze it, and I think, I hope you will hear that this week. On Wednesday, I want to, to do the class on the 17 most boring verses in the New Testament. <laughs> and I want to show you how you read these verses, which is totally different from the way the fundamentalist would read it. And I think the task is to, is to put scholarship to work and, and not to spend time arguing about it, but just say, this is the way we now believe it came into being. Uh, but I don't want to be cruel to fundamentalists. Uh, as I say, I grew up one. Uh, I grew up in a fairly dysfunctional family. My father was an alcoholic. He died when I was 12. My mother didn't finish the ninth grade. She was functionally illiterate. My mother was as sweet a woman as I've ever known. And yet her ability to embrace anything that I was talking about was just limited. I'll never will forget a time I called her one Saturday and I'd done some lectures in Charlotte on sexuality issues and I was starring in the letters to the editor department of the Charlotte Observer for about six weeks thereafter. <laughs> and all of the letters were calling me dreadful names. And mother was reading them with her morning cup of tea. And she said, son, I don't understand why everybody doesn't like you. You're such a nice boy. And I said, well, thank you, Mother, but uh, tell me what you don't understand and maybe I'll be able to explain it to you. And she said, well, son, what is a heterosexual? <laughs> and I said, that's what you are, Mother. Well, that must be all right. <laughs> you love that person. You don't try to debate with them. You love them. And you save the debate for people who should know better and who don't bother to do the necessary study. But I don't want to be, I couldn't have made it through my early life had I not been a fundamentalist. If I hadn't had that sense that God was a supernatural being in the sky who took me by the hand and led me through the, the anxiety and trauma of my childhood, I'm not sure I'd be standing here today. So to me, it was a great crutch. But if I hadn't outgrown that crutch, I don't think I could be a Christian today. And so I have a, a witness of appreciation for my fundamentalist background and a sense that we've got to free people from that mentality so they can grow into what I think the Christian faith is all about. But thank you, sir. A lady. Shall I? What? No, I'll take you right after this lady, I promise. <laughs> Thank you. These men will have to wait. <laughs> and notice I'll... how my wife intervenes on behalf of men. <laughs> yes. And I'll try to be ladylike. Thank you. Um, I'm curious as to the whole demise of the feminine aspect of God and the different names of God and... and uh, you know, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, and I'm told that El Shaddai actually means many-breasted one, but now is translated as, you know, high almighty. And so just the whole, you know, other religious cultures have much more of a sense of the feminine divine than we have seemed to evolve with. So. Who does? Other cultures. You yeah, know, well, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt. I don't, I don't know that. There's a lot of feminist revisionists uh, thinking that goes on about trying to find feminine images in the Bible. Uh, See, so I don't think it helps to make God a woman anymore than it helps to make God a man. I think God, whatever God is, God's got to transcend gender. 
at least as human beings understand. But the, if you look at the history of religion, the history of human religion, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the week, uh, what happens is that we always think of God after the analogy of the most powerful image that we can come up with in our human experience. And it started out, God was animistic. God was, it was a spirit-filled world, and they were sort of neuter spirits. And then we, we stopped being hunter-gatherers, and we became settled agricultural people, and God became quite feminine. That's why Mother Earth is called Mother Earth. That's why Mother Nature is called Mother Nature. Uh, the, the whole feminine concept was that it was the woman of the tribe and the woman of the female of the species that kept the tribe alive, and God was thought of after the analogy of, of the woman. And then as those agricultural communities got more and more complex, they needed to be protected, and male power came back in as sort of the military types, and out of the military arose the general or the chief, and God then became primarily thought of as the male after the analogy of the male chief. And that's dominated in Western civilization with the feminine always fighting to come back. It's like the yin and the, yin and the yang. You can repress the feminine, but it's always going to come back in some form. The feminist movement, the peace movement, the environmental movement, everything the right wing in America is opposed to is part of the feminist revival. And, and I think there's something incredible going on in our country, in the world, with the revival of feminine possibilities. And I'm the father of daughters, and I rejoice in that. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, I promised you next. This is the, um, this year is the 50th anniversary of uh, Pope John 23rd's calling of Vatican Council II. How do you think the Catholic Church is doing with regard to the spirit of Vatican II? That's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> had great admiration for John the 23rd. And I agree with the person who said, all the Roman Catholic Church needs is a new John installed in the Vatican. <laughs> I have many friends who are Catholic priests and Catholic scholars. And I think it's fair to say that from John 23, and Vatican II, it was so frightening a new insight for that very traditional institution that the winds of change became so scary that every pope since John the 23rd has battened down the hatches a little more. And you can't go from Paul the VI to John Paul the I to John Paul the II to Benedict the XVI without recognizing that you're walking steadfastly into yesterday. There is hope. One of the great things about the Roman tradition is that if they elect a surprise like John the 23rd, the whole church changes overnight. That's what authority is all about. And, and so the next pope, I can't tell you that he's going to be a shining light or a great liberal thinker, but he's going to be more liberal than Benedict the 16th. If for no other reason, he's going to be at least 20 years younger. And he will have been shaped by a different generation. And it may take a longer time to re-engage the issues of Vatican II. But in the meantime, traditional Christianity as we recognize it is dying. So I don't know how long you want to sit around and try to revivify the traditions of yesterday when all of them are dying. And I think that's the challenge that's before us. Uh, thank you for your question. I'm so glad I finally got to you. Yes, sir. Um, much of your speech uh, had to do with the latest historical thinking on the origins of all of the words that many of us have uh, spent our childhood and early adulthood learning and living by. Uh, so for you, I have a very simple question. It has three parts. And it, <laughs> it, un it unfortunately requires the application of everything that you know that we don't know. So who was Jesus Christ? Where did he come from? And where did he go? Well, I hope you're here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. <laughs> uh, there's no way I can begin to answer those questions in the time that we've got. Uh, I'll simply say I think he was a real figure of history, and I'm prepared to debate that. 
uh, and to try to document that. I don't believe it's possible for mythology to have created Jesus of Nazareth in the very short time. It takes mythology just a little bit longer than we have. You know, if you read Paul's letter to the Galatians, you'll find that Paul, whose conversion most scholars would date somewhere between one and six years after the crucifixion, but three years after his conversion, he says that he consults with James, the brother of Jesus, and with Peter. So I don't believe you can develop a mythology of a non-existent person in that short a period of time that would shape Paul's life the way it shaped Paul's life. But that's a, a much bigger, that's just a beginning. It'd be a much bigger issue. Uh, and to, you know, if, if I were to ask, answer, try to answer the questions of where did he go and where is he now, uh, I could refer you to some books I've written and they're both about 350 pages long. And uh, that would not be fair to this uh, wonderful audience. So I'll just sort of stop with that. Yes, ma'am, we have a lady. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. I hope this isn't too obscure. I wonder what you think about the idea of the Aramaic uh, origins of the New Testament and work by people like Neil Douglas Klotz. I don't think there's a thing to an Aramaic origin. Uh, that is a written origin. I don't, I don't think there's a major biblical scholar in the world that would salute the flag of some mm -hmm. early Aramaic version of any gospel. Uh, there were lots of attempts at that in oh, 50 years ago, but most of them, the way things work in scholarship is that people run a flag up the flagpole and see if anybody salutes it, right. and nobody salutes that. Right. Uh, I've spent the last four years of my life writing or reading in pre pre preparation to writing a book on the Gospel of John. And I'm convinced that there is a very early, very Jewish core to the Gospel of John, but it's not in Aramaic. Uh, even the earliest core of John, I'm quite sure, was written in Greek. And uh, I don't know that it helps. We had a scholar in the early part of the 20th century, and I think his name was C.C. C. Torrey, who translated the Gospels back into Aramaic to see if he could pick up some things. And the only thing I remember that he picked up was that story about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, which, whatever you think about that, is a terrible analogy, since I don't know of any camels that try to go through eyes of needles. And so it's, it's caused people to think that maybe one of the gates into the city of Jerusalem was called the Eye of the Needle. And, uh, but that's just really stretching it. And what this man said was that the, the Hebrew word or the Aramaic word for camel and the Aramaic word for rope were almost identical except for a, an accent mark. And probably that original saying was it's easier for a rope to go through the Eye of a Needle than for a rich man to get in the camel. It doesn't make the rich man's plight any better. <laughs> uh, but I think that's about the best you can do. I don't think there's any credibility to Aramaic originals of any of the Gospels. Thank you. Hmm? May I follow that up? Sure. Um, what about the idea of retranslating the Lord's Prayer and other prayers into a language that Jesus might have spoken? Well, when you get to the Lord's Prayer, despite the fact that in almost every church people say, and now as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, and we say the Lord's Prayer, there's some real question about whether Jesus ever prayed the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it doesn't appear in the New Testament until you get to Matthew. Mark doesn't know anything about it. Paul never heard of it. It's in Matthew and it's in Luke. John does not include anything about it. The two versions in Matthew and Luke are sufficiently different. Uh, so there's some possibility that that this is material out of what they call the Q document, which might run it a little bit earlier. But uh, it's a prayer that already interprets Jesus as the inaugurator of the kingdom of God. And it prays for his second coming. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Give us enough food to sustain us until the second coming. And don't put us to the test so that we fall. It's a prayer of the early church living with an understanding of Jesus between the crucified one and the second coming one. 
And it would be almost inconceivable to me that Jesus could have prayed that prayer because it would have involved a, a trans, a, an interpretation of his role which is so different from anything that he would have claimed for himself. So I don't find that terribly uh, compelling as an argument. Thank you. Yes, sir. I wonder whether the cannon should have been closed when it was, and if, if so, should it be reopened now? I think that's a wonderful question. I think the great sin of Christian history was that we closed the Bible and said God does not speak anymore. God's been on a 2,000-year sabbatical. <laughs> and the fact is that if you take the books of the Bible, if you take the 66 that are in most Protestant Bibles, or if you add the Apocrypha, which are in many other Bibles, you discover that there's not a female voice in there, not even the book of De the story of Deborah is written by Deborah. There's not a voice of color in there, unless you consider all Semitic people voices of color. Uh, and I'm really convinced that spirituality is a far deeper thing than what we have captured in the scriptures. And I think it's a terrible thing that we've closed it. I wish some of the great women mystics of the ages, like Julian of Norwich, could be read as scripture. I think Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail ought to be an epistle. And I think we ought to... My church gets around that. Now notice that we did the same thing in the chapel on Sunday, in the amphitheater on Sunday. You have a reading that is not from Scripture. I think it was W.H. Auden, wasn't it, on Sunday that we read. Uh, and we have people in churches reading a contemporary lesson, and they'll come from, from all sorts of uh, wonderful, insightful people through history. And... Uh, and I think that's uh, we need to compensate. I don't mean to say the, the Bible is limited. Well, I think it is limited. It's limited in that its focus is male. Its focus is history. Somewhere between 1000 BCE and 2000 CE. That's where the Bible... And that's, that's, it's written over a period of 1,000 years, 3,000 years ago. It's written from, from about 1,000 BCE to about 135 of this common era. Most scholars today think Second Peter was written about 135. And it's not a, a book that's terribly edifying. Uh, and it's interesting that almost none of the lectionaries include any readings from Second Peter, which gives you some sense of what the church thinks about some of the books of and there are not any from books in the Old Testament, too, like Nahum. I love to get fundamentalists together who tell me that every word of the Bible is the word of God. And I say, well, tell me what the book of Obadiah says. And you get a glazed over look. Uh, it's, not, it's not kind. But, uh, you know, I just think we ought to stop worshiping the Bible and try to worship the God to whom the Bible points, sometimes in very inadequate ways. Yes, uh, do I have a lady? Is it a lady's turn? I'm now confused. Uh, there's one here, so let me take this lady. Go ahead, okay. and then I'll come to you. All right. We um, know your journey as you described it from a fundamentalist background to uh, that of progressive Christianity. And this is a story we hear from many of our, our leaders in theological thought. Is this an inevitable journey? And if so, how do we deal with our children, those of us who consider us ourselves progressive uh, Christians? Um, where do we bring this story to children so that it makes that journey possible or avoids that journey? Well, an awful lot of our children have left organized religion. And I don't think it does much good to try to bring them back unless we change organized religion. Uh, all they're coming back to is the same thing that repelled them in the first place. Uh, one of my daughters has a PhD in physics from Stanford. And she said to me once, Dad, the questions you all are answering aren't questions we even ask anymore. That's a pretty radical statement. And, and I think we ought to take that seriously. I think that we need to, to articulate what we know about the Bible in a very different way, and it will shatter some of the assumptions that people bring to Scripture. 
But maybe those assumptions ought to be shattered. Uh, I don't believe you help by trying to oppress knowledge. Uh, someone said to me, I'm not ever going to listen to you because you might destroy my faith. I said, Madam, if I can destroy your faith in one hour, you don't have much. Uh, and any God who can be killed ought to be killed. Now that's, it seems to me that if I've got to defend God from knowledge or truth, then the God I worship is already dead. I don't see any, I don't see any reason why I would want to continue worshiping. Imagine a God that needs to be defended by Jack Spong. What an inadequate creature that would be. Uh, no, I think that I love the discussion this morning with Norman Lear when they talked about whether conservatives could make fun of conservatives as much as liberals make fun of liberals or why it is that most of the artistic people in Hollywood are liberal. And I don't mean to get into a political debate here, but the fact is that the very nature of being liberal means you're open to new possibilities. And so all the people who are going to be breaking new ground aren't going to be conservative. Now, if, if you live long enough, the people who break ground today, a generation from now, are looked upon as conservative. But the way it, the way it works is that new ground is always broken by people who are willing to walk out of the familiar patterns and onto the frontier. My great mentor in life, to whom I am still deeply devoted, was an English bishop named John A.T. Robinson. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard of him. He was a close friend, and, and I, I've adopted much of him. He mentored me in a, in a lot of my life. But John said toward the end of his life that he was quite convinced that history would record him as a conservative Orthodox person. And I think that's probably correct. I expect I will have the same fate the world has a way of rushing past those who might have been leaders in their generation and then they die and they're frozen and the world keeps going and so in retrospect they looked very different. Abraham Lincoln would be a racist by our definition today and so would Harry Truman and yet both of them moved the civil rights movement forward in a tremendously positive way but you can't judge things that way in history. One more question. Who's, who's, who's up? Hello? We only have one more question. We can only have one. But you, I don't think mine was answered, but okay. I only want to say that I think you were speaking of adult children. We're both old enough that we, our children are adults. Yep. I'm talking about five-year-olds, well, ten-year-olds, and twelve-year-olds. Yeah, that anything, was, that was my question. I don't know anything about young children. I think children ought to be born 18 years old so I can talk to them. <laughs> uh, I greatly admire people who know how to communicate with children, but I'm not one of them. I just love them, and I don't try to communicate biblical knowledge or theological concepts to them, uh, but I really think people ought to do it. And there are some people today that I'm in touch with that are really working on getting something besides the absolutely god-awful material that we use in most Sunday schools uh, done. Uh, will you be our final one? Thank you. You mentioned earlier that there isn't a very strong feminine influence in the Bible, and I do agree with you. However, there is the figure of the Virgin Mary, and throughout different denominations of the Christian religion, her role is emphasized differently and her importance in the faith life. What is your personal opinion on the role that she plays in the Bible and her role in our faith lives? I don't want to dishonor that figure, but... Folks, let me tell you that she's not a woman that women would create. She's a male version of an ideal woman. And let me just play with that for one second. The ideal woman was defined as the church, by the church, as a permanent virgin. To whom is a permanent virgin an ideal woman? Only to a celibate male. Who was doing the defining? She's a virgin mother. If the ideal woman is a virgin mother, every other woman is compromised and inadequate. Maybe you haven't noticed it's hard to be a virgin mother. <laughs> and so the church split that. 
There's only one ideal, and everybody else is less than ideal. And if you're going to be less than ideal, you have a choice. You can be a virgin, hie thee to the nunnery. Or you can be a mother, and that means no birth control. And so the prohibition against birth control comes out of this negativity toward women. That, uh, you know, there's something evil about women and you redeem yourself by having a baby every time you have a sexual liaison or at least having that potential. Or you go be, uh, you go be a, a nun. I think there's another figure in the New Testament that could maybe be developed by women, not by men into a powerful female symbol, and that's Mary Magdalene. But I think what the church has done to Mary Magdalene is to make her the opposite of a virgin. You know, if you're the opposite of a virgin, you're a prostitute. There's not a shred of evidence in the Bible that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, not a shred. There was a number done on her by leaders in the Christian church, male leaders, because she was clearly, closely associated with Jesus of Nazareth, and so they wanted to repress her. And so Mary Magdalene was repressed and, and compromised and defined as a prostitute or a whore. And in her place, the sexless virgin mother appeared as the primary woman. And in some sense, that's the way men have always played the game with women. You're either a virgin or a prostitute. Now, I just think there's more to being a woman than that. I'm the father of daughters. And I don't want anybody telling me that my daughters at birth aren't fit to be president or bishop or pope. I, uh, you know, I just think everybody ought to have a right on the basis of their own experience, ability, and competence to be anything the world has got to offer. And I see no reason why women have to bear the, the trauma of male definition throughout the ages as they have done. Uh, I recommend, I don't know about you folks, but I know that I couldn't be who I am if Christine weren't who she is. Uh, and what I think that is so wonderful about life is the complementary qualities of two people deeply in love who make each other more fully human than they could possibly have been without the partner. And, and I think we've got to get away from those old games of superiority. Thank you. I hope I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.